Good evening. It's so good to be uh, back here again. I think I've been here so many times. Um, maybe this is a new group, but I'm uh, always thankful for an opportunity to share God's word. This is the best thing that uh, we can do together, to fellowship around God's word. Um, it's the one thing, by the way, that God has said will remain forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain, isn't it? Can you imagine everything, even what we are studying today, as good as it is, as helpful as it is, thank you, all of that will disappear. All our titles, all our glory, um, all our joys, all our pains, all our desires, our hopes, our deepest needs, our greatest accomplishments, they will all disappear, but the word of God will remain. This is such an amazing thing. Never take the sharing of God's word as being a simple thing. This is actually the highlight of uh, a time like this when God's people meet together. The highlight is not in the singing. The singing is part of it, but when we come and we open God's word, it's such a blessed thing. So as you have heard, my name is Dominic Kafaria. I am married to Jacqueline Wangeshi. She, she's here with me. Uh, she's shy, so I will not ask her to stand or wave. You will stand. <laughs> okay, she won't. But uh, she was a student here at Jekwat. Uh, I remember preaching when I was preaching here sometime. I think you were seated somewhere there. <laughs> somewhere there. I can't remember. But it was somewhere around this area. So uh, if you want to know how we met, see me after this. Eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, um, it's, it's always a joy to be here with you, uh, with you brethren. Uh, let me ask us to open our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We will be considering the words of verses 8, or rather 9 to 11, but let me read 9, 8 to 11 so that we are able to understand the context. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. I'll be reading from the ESV, uh, so let me read. Please hear the reading of God's word. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you. We plead. We cry. We ask of you, O Heavenly Father, that you would reveal to us your word. We cannot understand your word unless you, O Heavenly Father, by your Holy Spirit, Reveal to us the truths hidden in the scriptures. Oh, our Heavenly Father, our desire is that we would know Christ. And that as we know Christ, our joy would be full. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would again walk by your Holy Spirit in our hearts this evening so that we would understand your word. Oh Lord, we pray that as your word goes forth, that the hopeless would be encouraged, that the careless would be warned, that the weak would be strengthened, that the sinner would be saved. Please hear us, O Lord, for we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. 
after the wa uh, World War II, there was a man who was discovered in the jungles of um, Indonesia. It was in the 90s. He was a Japanese soldier who fought for the Imperial Army of Japan. The Imperial Army of Japan is the army that fought in the Second World War and was defeated in, is it 1945? That's when Japan finally surrendered. But this guy was in the jungle somewhere in Indonesia. He's by himself. He didn't know that the war had ended. Can you imagine, for almost two decades, the guy had his gun ready. He, had, uh, he would go out, hunt, come back to his cave. Go out and hunt. When his um, fellow soldiers, some of them had died, some of them had gone back home, and they were living their lives as normal. Japan was, after the devastation of the Second World War, I mean, being hit by two nuclear bombs, completely devastated. Japan was, by the 1950s and 60s, becoming one of the biggest economies in the world. And some of the people who fought in World War II were far wealthier than they were when the war began. Because the economy was doing better, because they had peace with the US, they had peace with Europe. Some of the men who fought alongside this man were living wonderful lives, they were marrying and they were having children and life was going on. But this one guy was still in the jungle. True story, by the way. You can go and research it. It was actually put on Time magazine. It was all over the place. This guy was still living a miserable life in the jungles of Indonesia. Why was he living such a life? Why is it that the people who he fought alongside with were enjoying their lives, were going on with life. They, they uh, had moved on. They were marrying and uh, having children and enjoying themselves. Why is it that this guy was out in the, in the jungle by himself? Because he did not hear the news, isn't it? No one came and told him, bro, the war is over. Let's go back home. Let's go back home. Go back to your home. Leave your gun there. Leave your uniform there. Let's go back home. Go back to your shamba. Go back and look for your wife. Go back and look for your children. Go back and continue on with your life. I think by the time he was landing in Japan, he was shocked because he found a different Japan. I mean, he found big buildings, huge roads, cars, electric train, things that he did not even, uh, that were not there when he left Japan to go and fight. But because, again, he did not hear the news, the good news, the war is over. The man was living a miserable life. The reality today is that all humanity is living under a miserable condition. Miserable condition. Look at the world today. Look at our lives today. We are far better off than our grandparents and our great-grandparents, isn't it? Aren't we? I mean, did our great-grandparents have the opportunity to sit down like this and study? and have opportunities where they can study and go outside the country or be uh, great people in the country. They didn't have that. Our health care today is far much better than that of our great-grandparents, isn't it? We are far better than them. But are we living a better life than them? What do you guys think? I'd say yes, no, yes, no, maybe. But the reality is we are living in more bondage, more problems, more mental issues. Why? Because 
all of humanity like that man is hiding from something, is fearful of something. They are bound by fear, they are caged by fear, such that they cannot go out and just move and make something of themselves. We cannot do that. And for us to understand the message, I've titled my message today, Joy to the World. For us to understand the reality that they are, by the coming of Christ, there is joy in the world, we have to see that, first of all, there is sorrow and misery and pain and calamity in the world, isn't it? That's the reality. If it doesn't hit you, wait until you leave. You leave school and you have to go out there and you have to make a life for yourself and you have to look for a job and you find a job and you have to keep a job and when you keep that job and you have to fight to be promoted and it's just one fight, one battle, one thing after another and another and another and that's life. Why is this the case? Well, I want us to see three things this evening as we look at the reality of what Christ brought, joy to the world. As we look at this passage this evening, I want us to see that first of all, observe the fear that is in all mankind. Look at verse 9. We are told in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with what? Great fear. Great fear. The default mode, the default reality of all humanity towards the things of God and towards God himself is not simply fear, but great fear. These men, these shepherds, are a representation of all of us. Imagine an angel appears, and we are given these words. I love how Luke, who is a doctor, gives details whenever he is recording certain accounts. He says, the angel appeared, and the glory of the Lord shone around them and filled the place, it was all over the place. But when the glory of the Lord appears in the scene, what happens? Instead of wonder, instead of amazement, there is fear. I normally tell people, you know the way that we like singing, you know, Lord, open heaven and uh, come, O oh Lord, send you know, people even say this as a joke, which is very serious. You know, uh, Lord, send angels or uh, don't even send the angels, come by yourself. <laughs> Have you ever had such a thing? Eh? Here's the reality. I'm telling you, if an angel appears and the glory of the Lord shines and fills this place, no one will be left in this room. <laughs> All the doors will be, everyone will be looking for the exit. We would all be startled. We would all be shocked. For those who are not able to run, they will do what? They will just lie dead. Don't we see that in the Bible? Do we see that by the happening in the Bible where people see angels and they fall flat and dead? Right? Like when John sees an angel, he falls as if he is dead. He doesn't even want to look again. And this is a creature. This is simply a creature. And man cannot stand that. Falls to the ground. Hiding. You know, after that, if, 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 if an angel were to appear here, we would all be traumatized, isn't it? It would be a traumatic thing because we wouldn't even be able to explain what we saw. But why is this the case, by the way? We need to ask ourselves, where does this fear 
of the glory of God come from? Why is it that these men were filled with fear? Why weren't they saying, wow, an angel? You know how we think? We would say, guys, come, come, come and see an angel. Why is it that they, they were not doing that? They were not calling their neighbors. They were not taking selfies. <laughs> right? What was happening? The problem is our hearts. Why the fear? Was this fear always there? To answer this question, we need to go back to the beginning. We need to see that God made man in his image, in his likeness, and man was covered by the glory of God. Right? The Bible says that God made them male and female, and they were naked and they were not ashamed, covered by the glory of God. What happened? The glory that used to cover them is now the very thing that they are afraid of. What has happened? What has happened to us? We need to ask ourselves that question. Why is it that, for example, we fear death? And we fear death because we know that we cannot stand the glory of God. It is too overwhelming. Why is it that the fear the man has now the fear of the glory of God like this man. It is because in the beginning man had deep communion with God. A communion that was so intense, so deep, that the very glory of God covered them and they enjoyed it. And as the Bible shows us in Genesis, God would come to the garden. And they would hear God walking in the garden. They would hear Yahweh walking in the garden. And they would rush to him. And they would commune with Yahweh. They would have time with Yahweh. Now again, we, the Bible doesn't explain to us how this happens. Uh, this is the reality that God appeared to Adam and Eve in the garden, as we see in Genesis 3, is what is called the Theophanies or the Old Testament appearances of Christ. So he was there with them. Yahweh would walk with them. And they did not fear. They enjoyed it. But then something fundamentally changed. Something that brought man from enjoying the presence of God to fearing the presence of God. What had fundamentally changed? Sin had entered into the picture. We are told that our first parents disobeyed God. And God told them, when you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And by the way, that tree was not poisonous as some people think it is. It was a normal tree. We don't know what kind of a tree again it is, but it was a normal tree. But simply God told them, don't eat from that tree. Just like, for example, if you read the book of Leviticus, you find it very interesting that God tells the Israelites some of the animals that they can't eat. Have you ever read that in the Bible? And you wonder, why? Why, God, would you keep us from eating pork and, and uh, at least at that, in that covenant? Why would you keep them from eating this and from eating that and tell them, you know, an animal with this kind of a hoof eat and with this kind of a hoof do not eat? And you wonder, why is it that God has a problem with some of the animals? It's not that they are poisonous. It's not that they are even unhealthy, as some people think. No. God simply wants to show you that if God tells you, do not eat, do not, he doesn't have to give you a reason. He simply wants to see that you obey him. It's not that if you eat 
Okay, let me not give an example of a lizard. A lizard can be poisonous, eh? <laughs> it's not that if you eat a camel, or in those days, if you eat a camel, a camel has certain poisons or toxins that would kill you. That was not the case, isn't it? Simply that God wanted to show that I am God and you are man. Obey me. Do not eat. And by the way, the same reality, not in terms of the foods we eat, in Christ we can eat all those foods, but there are things that are forbidden to us in the new covenant. And sometimes we wonder, why God are you saying I cannot do this and I cannot do that? It's simply because God is God. We can't question him. But what happened to our parents? They disobeyed, they ate. That which they were told, do not. They took them the place of God. They listened to the serpent. Man believed a lie. He was already in the image of God, isn't it? By the way, that's the interesting thing about Genesis. I mean, you are already in the image of God, but yet the devil comes and tells you, you know what you will be like? God. And they believed it. They believed a lie. And because they did that, they rebelled against God. That God was keeping something good from them. And that man can gain good outside of God. Trouble happened. The result, a broken relationship. A relationship that was now so severely broken that man who loved God was now hiding from God. When you read Genesis 3, that's our history, that's our lives today. The reason why we would scamper and run away if the glory of God comes indeed and fills this place. By the way, again, look at when the temple was built and the Bible says that when after Solomon had prayed, the Bible says, and the glory of God filled the temple. And what is the next thing that we are told? It filled the temple such that who could not go in? Wow, you guys don't know your Bibles, eh? Bible quiz. Who could not go in? The? The? The priests. Clap for that man, Amejaribu at least. The priests could not go in. Can you imagine the priests? The people who had been anointed, called, set apart, given the very duty of entering into the presence of God. They could not. They looked at the glory of God. It was so awesome. It was so great. Sometimes we misrepresent. We think... The glory of God is simply shiny smoke, isn't it? And I see, by the I see preachers abusing the glory of God. You have no idea what the glory of God is. I see the glory of God. I see the glory of God. Man, if you saw the glory of God, You would, be, you would leave that mic, you would run away. Like people will not even see you. The camera guy will simply be doing this. Um, say you happy. Where is he? Please, don't mess with the holy things of God. Don't mess with the holy things of God. The glory of God was so powerful, so overwhelming. The priests stood outside. They knew they were supposed to go inside. They knew it was their job. To go inside and offer sacrifices, they could not. They stood outside. They looked at it. They waited until the glory of God was lifted. Then they could go in. Who are you and I to think that we can simply play around with the glory of God? Man was now afraid. Adam and Eve were now afraid of the glory of God. They had the footsteps of Yahweh. They had the footsteps of Yahweh. 
the footsteps that once brought them joy, the footsteps that would make them joyful and excited and happy, they had the same footsteps and they hid. They hid themselves. They hid under bushes and they cut some more bushes to hide themselves. This is the reality of sin. Don't play around of, with sin. Don't think so lightly of sin. Don't be dismissive of sin. That sin of yours that you think you can play around with, that pet sin of yours, is such an abomination in the presence of God. And that's why then fear is what characterizes humanity. All humanity is fearful. That's why these men are fearful when they see the glory of God. But then secondly, having seen the reality that all humanity is under fear, hiding themselves, we see the good news brought to these men that that's not the end of the story and we thank God. Amen? We thank God that it doesn't end there. It doesn't end at men being fearful. Look at verse 11. There is that good news. Let me read verse 10 and 11. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day this, in, the, in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Fallen and corrupt humanity, as we see by the example of this man, was characterized by fear when they interacted with God and the things of God. The Bible describes men as not only fearing God, but they were repulsed by the light of God. If you if you look at John chapter 1, John speaks about the coming of the light. And look at what the Bible says. That when the light came, what happened to men? They feared it. They ran away from it. They could not stand that light. In um, uh, sorry, in John chapter one, this is what we are told about the reality of humanity. That the light came, which is Christ. He he was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own people, and they did not receive him. But the story doesn't end there. There is good news. Even though man rejects God, even though man fears God, that doesn't stop God from acting for the good of man. Our sin, our great sin, our abominable sin, does not hinder God from acting for our good as we see in the gospel of Christ. We see here an angel sent and he proclaims this good news. Do not fear. Why shouldn't you fear? There is good news. God in his mercy has appointed a savior in the city of David. God has created, has made a way for your salvation because the truth is man cannot approach God. Man cannot love God. Man will run away from God at every point. And therefore, what does God do? God appoints a savior. He is eternally 
begotten son. To be born. To be born as a man. So that he may be as Romans chapter 5 puts it. So that he may be the second. Christ is the second. Adam. The first Adam failed. The first Adam fell with all of us. When the first Adam fell and failed, he did not just simply give us a wrong example because some people think of Adam's sin as simply the reason why then we have sin is because Adam gave us a wrong example. No. Adam's sin has been imputed on all of us. I remember when I was a young boy uh, going to Sunday school class, I used to constantly ask that question. Why is it that the sin of this man is now my sin? I did not get that. And I, I asked that question, and I asked that question, and I don't think any Sunday school teacher answered me or gave me a good answer. Why is it, teacher, that Adam sinned, and now I'm told I am? I am a sinner because of Adam. Isn't that unfair? I don't know whether you asked that question. But some people would look at that and say, isn't that unfair? No. Adam wasn't simply our father genetically or the first man. He was a representative. He was a federal head. You know how, for example, when the president signs a deal for the SGR and he takes a loan of, let's say, 400 billion from the Chinese? Guess what? You and I have to pay it. But you are not there in that room. I wasn't there. Please, KRA, don't tax me. Imagine if you go to KRA and tell them that. I know you guys need that money. I know you need to pay that loan. But guess what? I wasn't there in that room. I didn't tell him to represent me. I actually didn't even vote for him. I voted for the other guy. Does it count? We accept it, isn't it? This person is your representative. How much more in a greater way is, is it with Adam? But now we don't simply have the first Adam. The angels are announcing the great news. Here comes the second Adam. This is why there is now joy in the world. The second Adam is coming. A greater Adam is coming. A sinless Adam is coming. An Adam who will be tempted in every way Yet without sin. That is Hebrews. Those who know their Bible. Bible quiz. Hebrews. Siwambi mtatafuta iyo. Sao. He was tempted in every way. But yet remained. Yes? Hebrews. Chapter 12. Ama, sorry. Twelve, okay. <laughs> sure. Let me check. No, no, you. It's four. Yes, four. Four fifteen, isn't it? The second Adam. That's the great reality of the second Adam. Let me just read that. Oh, you may wake up. Thank you so much. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way. Actually, the word tested there is tempted. Tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. This is the great news that the angels are proclaiming. You remember, the first Adam was tested in a garden. The garden was lush. The garden was beautiful. The garden had food. 
Where is the second Adam tested? He is tested in the wilderness. Look at your Bibles. Is it in uh, Matthew 3? We are told that the Holy Spirit takes him where? To the wilderness to be tested. The, second, the first Adam was tested in a lush place. The second Adam is tested in a broken place. In a place where the only thing that is there are rocks and snakes and sand. The first Adam was tested in a place where he had abundant food. He had communion with God. He had everything. Yet he failed. The second Adam is tested in the wilderness. This is the great news, by the way. That's why we are singing joy to the world. Joy? Why do we have joy? The second Adam passed the test. The first Adam failed and failed badly. The second Adam passed. When the devil came to him, and told him, turn this rock into bread. Eat, satisfy yourself. You remember he came to the first Adam, eat. Come on, eat. The first Adam fell. The second Adam remained firm, remained true. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then he takes... You know, the other interesting thing, by the way, do, I'll give you a homework, so, so, do a comparison between the first Adam and the second Adam. Look at the fact that the first Adam was only tested once. The second Adam is tested three times. That's why it is a joyful message. He didn't just pass once. He didn't just pass twice. He passed three times. He obeyed God three times. He disobeyed God one time. Come, let me take you to a place and let me show you all the kingdoms of the world. Look at them. Look at their glory. Look at their power. Look at all the wealth in the world. Look at the, all the armies. Look at all the gold, the silver, the technology. Look at all that you can have. Come on. Take it. Just bow down to me. Another interesting thing by there about the temptation of the second Adam is that the devil doesn't even tell him, go and kneel before me in front of a group of people, in front of the Sanhedrin, in front of the synagogue. He tells him, do it here. We're just the two of us. No one needs to know, isn't it? By the way, isn't that what the devil tempts us with? Isn't it? Hakuna mtu anaona. It's just you and your laptop. Watch that video. No one will see. It's just you and your boyfriend or your girlfriend. It's just you and your thoughts. Jesus, it's just you and me. No one needs to see it. It will not be broadcasted. It will not be live on TV. Just bow down to me once, 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 and you get all this. And he passed. You shall worship the Lord your God only. And then come again. Let me take you to the highest point in the temple. Jesus, throw yourself, go down, jump. What will happen? The angels will come and hold you. You will not crush yourself. But then this is the key about this uh, temptation. Eh? The devil wanted Jesus to gain glory without going to the cross. He was telling Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. If you jump, who, who are in the temple? The holiest people, isn't it? the people of God, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the priests, if you jump and they all see you and they are screaming and they are thinking you will be crushed 
And then the angels come and they hold you up. And you're flying and you're hovering like Superman, isn't it? And they see you coming down. People will do what? They will worship you. They will be drawn to you. Jesus, they will finally believe your gospel. They will believe you. And Jesus says, you will not test the Lord your God. He knew that the God-appointed way for him to draw all men to him was that he goes to the cross. Isn't that what he says? When I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. He was talking about the cross. And by the way, again, the devil tempts us in that way. He wants us to avoid the cross. He wants you to avoid suffering. He wants you to avoid pain. He wants you to, to avoid embarrassment or being rejected. We have a great second Adam. And this is why this news is a great news. But then thirdly and finally, as I finish up, We, these men, don't, not, they don't just receive the news of the coming second Adam. They are called to respond to it. They are called to respond to it. Fear not is a response. You are required to respond. It's a command. This angel is telling them as a command, fear not. For I bring you good news of great joy. Great joy. The fear that was there should be replaced not with simply joy, but with great joy. As the angel announces the good news, he not only states the news, but he expects or he also gives the required response to the news. Great joy. And by the way, that's why when we preach the gospel, we don't just preach the gospel. We require a response, isn't it? We simply don't tell people that Jesus died for sinners. We require them to repent and believe, isn't it? Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a requirement, it's a command. Great joy is what is expected to replace fear. Joy to the world. Great, actually, I feel that him should be not joy to the world, but great joy to the world. Great joy to the world. Because those are the accurate words of the angel. The word that is translated joy is the Hebrew word kara, which means calm delight. Calm delight. Not over excited delight, because some people think. Have you ever found how find how sometimes we like saying, ah, that's a joyful person? Because they run around smiling, eh? We can say they are a bubbly person. But joy is seen in calm delight. It is calm. It is a delight, it is an enjoyment of the things of God in peace, in calmness. This is a contrast of the condition of the world which is filled with despair, sorrow, and people running up and down. The world is ever running up and down. One thing after the other, one thing after the other, one thing after the other, looking for joy and happiness. Isn't that what people say? If I can only find the best vacation spot, then I will be happy. And then you find the best ever vacation spot. Does it make you happy? After two weeks, you're bored. You're bored looking at the ocean. You're bored uh, by the smell of the ocean. You're bored by the sea breeze. Everything just bores you. It's so hot here. It's, ah, I want to go back home. And you go back home. And then you chase the next joy thing. 
I, if, I, if I could only buy a fast car and you buy the fastest car, oh, and you, you're the guy who is always overtaking people on the road to Namanga. <laughs> In your new Subaru. And you enjoy it and you enjoy it. Does it give you joy, really? For some time, ah, a Mark X guy overtakes you and your joy goes. India. A guy with a faster car. But oh, the joy that comes from God is a calm delight. It is peaceful. It doesn't need to run around to gain joy. It doesn't need to run around to be at peace. It doesn't need to jump all over the place. It is satisfied in God. It is at peace with God. The first Adam brought sorrow. The first Adam brought toil. The first Adam brought pain. Actually, look at that again. As you compare the first Adam and the second Adam. In the first Adam, we have the curse of toil. For you to gain bread. For you to gain satisfaction. For you to even look for satisfaction in this world. You will have to sweat. It doesn't simply mean the physical sweat. It means because I believe man used to sweat before the fall. Because we need... Uh, we, we need those sweat glands, isn't it? Don't we? Can you imagine, without the sweat glands, you know what happens. Uh, for those who have done medicine, you will not be able to maintain your body heat, isn't it? You in a kamko exam by the... It's so simply the, 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 this, like when man sinned, suddenly sweat glands appeared. It simply says that from now on, you will need to toil, you will need to run around, you will need to... The, the, there is an, a, an old song I remember when I was young, I used to uh, hear my grandmother singing. Mahanga iko na mahanga iko. Mnaijua? Ku ime wafanya wanadamu kumsahau mungu wao. I see Jemba now the right tune, but isn't that so true? That's what the first Adam brought. Kuhangaika, we are ever. Hey, ni aje mse mbaka wapi? Shuguli, 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 shuguli. Isn't that the, our, especially as young people? Niko shuguli, niko shuguli. Hey! Wah, mse. I'm not saying to kue busy, but kuna ingine, a-a. That's what the first Adam brought, running up and down. We, we move from one relationship to another. We think this will satisfy. Oh, now I've found a boyfriend who can truly, and nothing. Next one. Nah. Doesn't work. Let me try this class. Let me try this conference. Let me try this. Please, joy, the joy of the Lord, the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit is a calm delight. It's restful. It's peaceful. It's firm. It's quiet in God. God is not in that thunder, that earthquake. You remember the story of Elijah? God is in the still, small voice, calming voice. That tells you trust in Christ. Put your hope in Christ. Find your rest in Christ. To the sinner in this room, you've been running around. You've been running around, searching for joy. Probably you even come to this meeting thinking, I can finally find some joy. No one will give you joy. I won't give you joy. These people won't give you joy. It's only found in Christ. When you repent of your sins, when you let that baggage of your sin, when you let it fall and you run to him, and you have that calm delight in him, you have true joy. Joy to the world. Great joy to the world. 
That's the hymn we are supposed to sing. Sing it with a new understanding. Why? The second Adam has come. He has conquered. He has passed where the first Adam failed. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you because we were part of all humanity. Fearful. Hiding from your glory. Fearing to meet with you, our creator. Like this man, these shepherds, we have hidden from you. We have hidden when our consciences convict us of our sins. We have hidden ourselves when others have pointed your word to us. And we see, O oh Lord, how we have failed like the first Adam. But we thank you that, O oh Heavenly Father, you did not give up on us. That you sent us the message of joy, great joy, that the second Adam has been born. Born in the city of David. So that man may no longer die. The death that came through the first Adam is now conquered. And now we have life. and Life abundant in the second Adam. Oh, help us, our Heavenly Father, to have that joy, that peaceful, that quiet delight in you, that quiet delight in the work of Christ, that quiet delight in the person of Christ. Oh, Holy Spirit, we pray and we ask you that you would give us this joy, the joy that the world does not give, the, the joy that only Christ gives. We pray, O oh Lord, that this joy would remain in our hearts and that on that day when we finally see you face to face, we pray that our joy would be complete. So bless our time together, for we pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.